We know wherever there is inflammation in the skin, the barrier is in trouble a lot of times. And so if it is leaky, not only do we lose the water, but we also then have the risk of junk getting in that we don't want. So maybe your primary problem is psoriasis, but as you have this leaky skin, maybe your secondary problem then can become you're getting allergic to things or you're getting irritated by other things. So we really want to be on top of that no matter what, whenever there's inflammation. Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural episode of the Healthy Skin Show. And I have to tell you guys, I am so super excited. And the reason is that the Healthy Skin Show took six months of work to get to this moment for you to listen to it. And I am so appreciative to have you with me on this journey. So we've got a fantastic guest with us today on the show. His name is Dr. Peter Leo. But before we dive into that, I want to make sure that we honor space for you guys, for you, the listeners. And one way we are honoring that is by answering your questions and including them in the body of our episodes. So today's question comes from Kathy. I get intermittent bouts of eczema on the middle fingers of both hands that I can't contribute to any particular food. However, it seems to flare under emotional stress. So can emotions affect uh, perhaps the dysbiosis of certain microorganisms like candida that then manifest in eczema. First of all, Kathy, thank you so much for submitting a question. I deeply appreciate that. Now, for anyone listening who's like, wait, I had no idea that my emotional stress and what's going on with me could impact my gut, that could then impact my skin, because this is a pretty broad question. And it hits on a lot of different areas that we are going to explore over the course of the Healthy Skin Show. So if you guys are expecting me to just like talk about meds or say, oh, you can get this herb and that will help treat your itchiness or whatever, like that's not so much what the natural skin show is. It's not always the idea that there's a pill for everything or a supplement for everything. There's a lot of different deep connections within the body. And that's what we want to explore because everybody's pathway to rebuilding healthy skin is different. And the journey there may look quite different from one person to another, even if they have the same exact diagnosis. Like today, we're really going to be tackling eczema. But in our upcoming episodes, we've got skin conditions all across the board. So know that my answer, while Kathy's asking about eczema, for example, this actually can apply to pretty much any chronic skin rash condition out there. So yes, first of all, there is a very clear connection between what happens in your digestive system and what happens and what you experience within your brain or your mind, so to speak. And the way that that is physiologically connected is through the vagus nerve. So for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that's okay. Just know that there's a nerve, a really long nerve. It's called the vagal nerve, sort of like a vagabond because it runs throughout the body and um, connects a lot of different things. So the gut and the brain are connected through this vagus nerve. And so when you are chronically stressed out, you're experiencing a lot of stress, And it can be big stress. It can be little stress. It could be sitting in your car being really angry about the traffic, or it could be going through a divorce, losing your home, being in a traumatic accident, any number of things. That kind of stress absolutely impacts your digestive system as well as the microbiome. Stress can absolutely shift the microbiome or the bugs that live in your gut to a balance that is not necessarily healthy or friendly to you. So that's how we're like, okay, well, how did we get from microbiome, gut to candida? Candida is yeast. And so, yes, candida is an opportunistic fungal organism that does live in the gut. We all have candida, whether we are considered quote unquote healthy or not. It just depends on the balance of how much you have. And so when candida gets in an overabundance within the gut compared to everything else, that's not a great state to be in. So absolutely, you're, you can have a lot of stress in your system that can cause issues, allowing for candida, for example, which is much more opportunistic to 
kind of go crazy. And then maybe you're because you're stressed, you're eating not so hot, eating a lot of sugar and refined carbs. And Candida just loves that stuff, by the way. And as a result, the toxins that are produced by Candida and pretty much any bugs in the gut, your body has to deal with that. So the toxins that are produced by Candida are not very friendly to your system. And the less good bugs that you have in your body to produce certain types of byproducts, they're called short chain fatty acids. We'll, we will explore this in future episodes, by the way. So if you're like, wait, what is that? Don't worry. You are going to hear this again and again and again. So you will get in the know. But basically when we don't have these really good short chain fatty acids and a good abundance of them, that can mess up the communication between the bugs that live in your gut and the bugs that live on your skin. Yes, they do communicate the two microbiomes. So what happens in the gut does impact the microbiome on your skin. So Is it a direct thing? Maybe. There's many ways in which stress impacts the health and the microbiome of the skin and its ability to be flare-free and ultimately rash-free. However, if we're just going to go through that route of saying, okay, could stress impact the gut that then could impact the skin? The answer is yes, absolutely. That is absolutely possible. And so I want you guys to realize from the way that I'm answering this question that there are a lot more connections and um, clues in your body that oftentimes need to be looked at when you've gone to the dermatologist over and over and over again, you're not getting any help. The only answer seems to be their antibiotics or antifungals or steroid creams or some sort of steroid stuff. And then maybe like really, really kind of scary, let's be honest, kind of scary, some of these immunosuppressants um, that they offer as well. And so you kind of feel like you run out of options. And my hope is that you will see there's a lot of connections in the body that we can put together, that we can be detectives and start sorting this out and say, okay, my body is saying it needs help. How can I help it? How can I look for those clues? How can I become a savvy detective and really the best advocate that I can for myself so that I can ultimately get back to rebuilding healthier skin and eventually, fingers crossed, um, have the healthiest skin possible for me based on a variety of factors because that may look different for every single person. I hope that that is helpful and that is insightful. I don't want to go too deep into it because we have a lot of episodes coming your way that are going to dive super deep into this topic. I just wanted to introduce that to you now so that you understand if you're coming to this show saying, what am I going to get out of it? We're diving deep to look for the connections and those hidden reasons that your dermatologist and your doctors just aren't looking for. And I know because I had eczema all over my hands and they had no idea what was causing it. It was absolutely infuriating. I want to bring you on this journey to help you figure out those clues. With that said, let's dive into today's interview with one of the most brilliant integrative dermatologists I've had the honor of speaking with. If you don't know Dr. Leo, Dr. Leo is a clinical assistant professor of dermatology and pediatrics at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He received his medical degree from Harvard Medical School. Pretty, this is a smart guy, it sounds like. (laughs) Completed his internship in pediatrics at Boston's Children's College and his dermatology training back at Harvard, where he served as chief resident in dermatology. While at Harvard, he received formal training in acupuncture as well, and he's written a textbook on integrative dermatology. He's published over 100 papers. Dr. Leo, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I feel so honored. You're a super smart cookie, especially on skin stuff. <laughs> well, you'll see. We'll be the judge of that at the end of this. You let me know. <laughs> well, so first of all, we got this amazing recommendation from Dr. Aaron. He he clearly really respects your work and enjoys whatever sort of relationship that you guys have had going back and forth and sharing notes and whatnot. But he he recommended that I get in touch. And one of the cool things when I was starting to Google you and sort of like internet stalk you, I found this presentation and you were talking about skin barrier function. And so 
A lot of people don't fully understand what that means. They don't realize that their skin itself is a barrier to help protect us from the outside world. So could you give us a little bit in layman's terms, so not doctor speak, <laughs> layman's terms of what is a skin barrier and why is it important and how important is good skin barrier function? You know, the skin barrier is so critical. It's doing a lot of things. Not only is it keeping water in the skin, keep it hydrated and soft, but it's also keeping out all of the bad things in the environment. So it's keeping out allergens and irritants, chemicals that can cause reactions, and also infectious agents like bacteria and viruses. And so our skin barrier is really, really critical to keeping our skin healthy and keeping the immune system and our other allergies in check. It's our barrier to the outside world. And I often remind people that if you trace your skin as you go around your lips, that becomes your gut lining. So the skin and the gut are very, very closely related in their role. They're both keeping us from the outside world, the gut doing it internally where we digest, the skin doing it externally, but they really are part of the same epithelium. And so when we think about what is going on with atopic dermatitis, there's been a huge revolution in this thinking just in the last decade or so. About 10 years ago, there was a breakthrough paper and it was all focused on this protein called filaggrin. And filaggrin is really interesting. It's a structural protein in the skin. And we know if you don't make enough of this protein or if you have a mutation that it is not made correctly, then what happens is you have sort of what I like to call a leaky skin phenotype. Your, your skin is not holding water correctly and it's letting things in. Usually what this means is you just have very, very dry skin. And so specifically, you have this condition called ichthyosis vulgaris. You look dry and ichthyosis means fish-like because it almost looks like fish scales on the skin. But we know there's a huge correlation with that and atopic dermatitis or eczema. So the breakthrough really came when people said, golly, this, this is a huge independent risk factor for atopic dermatitis. And at least in some percentage of people, you can say, by golly, the reason you have this disease is because you're missing this gene. So on one hand, it's super exciting because finally we actually have the, the deepest possible root cause you can get. It's in your DNA. The fiber of your DNA is missing this piece. So that explains it. But on the other hand, it's a little bit frustrating because it says, golly, we can't mm. fix this, right? You're yeah. deficient in this genetically. So what do we do? So there's a couple of pieces. So that's part one. Part two, where things got really interesting, though, was that there were a series of papers that showed even if you make normal filaggrin, so the gene that encodes for it is abbreviated the FLG you know, kind of abbreviated mm -hmm. filaggrin, FLG gene, even if that's normal, in the presence of inflammation, you actually stop expressing filaggrin protein as much. So you become really? deficient, yeah, which is completely bizarre and totally interesting to me. So there's a lot of inflammatory cytokines, these inflammatory messengers, that when they're active, you become leaky skin. So wow. this, to me, finished the whole story. It's like, my gosh, eat wherever you start, if you start with genetically normal or if you start with abnormal, you end up with not making enough flagrant, having this leaky skin. And so that's sort of the chicken and the egg concept for atopic dermatitis. Some people probably start fine, but then have inflammation for other reasons that makes them deficient. Other people start deficient and they're already off to a bad start. Say you have an infection someplace, like a chronic long-standing infection. Could that inflammation that's caused as a result of like a longstanding, ongoing inflammatory process. Could that potentially also play a role in this? It definitely could, because in those patients that are making normal flagrant, have normal barrier to start, there probably is some trigger or triggers that then gets them into that inflammation cycle. So it could be an infection. It could be staph. It could be a viral infection. It could be just irritation. You know, one day you put on a cream that irritates you or is fragrancy or clothing. For example, wool clothing, we know the wool fibers, natural fiber, a great fiber, been used for, of course, millennia. But something about that fiber can, in certain people, irritate the nerve endings and drive them crazy. It feels itchy and uncomfortable comfortable. And so something like that could start the trigger. Then people scratch at the skin or rub at the skin, and then they start this inflammation process, which then means they become deficient in flagrin. So now we have, again, inflammation and barrier damage, the two key pieces to eczema. Wow. Okay. So first of all, I guess the question is, how do, how do you know what the deal is with your body's ability to make this very critical protein? It's a great question. And it can be tested, although it's still kind of experimental. It's expensive. There's not an easy way for anyone to get it done. But the more important point, I think, is that it doesn't matter because okay. if you have eczema, you know that you're deficient, either genetically really? or functionally, right? Okay. So because of that, you know, either chicken and eggs theory. So it doesn't matter which way. And if it's genetic, 
it's kind of reassuring, I guess. You say, well, I guess we know. We're going to treat it ultimately the same way because our goal with getting this under control is a couple things. We can artificially protect the barrier and support the barrier using moisturizers. And that's what my area of interest and passion is moisturizers, mm-hmm. trying to support the skin, strengthen the skin and protect it. And we know that moisturizers, even if you do nothing else, no medicine at all, just bland moisturizers, that helps. That helps most people significantly with their eczema. Now, as it gets more severe, that's not enough but it's still an important part of the process to get that skin protected. But the most exciting piece is what came from a guy named Dr. Eric Simpson in Oregon. Just a couple of years ago, he published a paper and his hypothesis was, what if eczema is the first step in the entire, what they call the atopic march, all the other problems that go along with atopic dermatitis? What if you just protect that skin from birth. And so they had a group of kids who were at high risk to develop atopic dermatitis. They put moisturizer on them from birth and they found that they were able to cut the development of eczema by 50% so that you can actually prevent developing atopic dermatitis just by strengthening that moisturizer barrier, that skin barrier with moisturizer. And the question that's still out there, but I I think we're going to find that by doing that, you also prevent all the other allergies, or at least some of the other allergies. You prevent food allergy because the newest thinking about food allergy. So for for many, many years, 50 plus years, people would come into the office and say, okay, I have eczema. I have atopic dermatitis. What food is driving this? I got to figure out what food this is because I know it's got to be a food, right? And we kind of said, well, yeah, maybe let's test it. And we do all this testing and people go on these exclusion diets. And certainly some people got better. And those people really told the world about it. I was better. I cut strawberries or I cut, cut gluten <laughs> and dairy. And they told everybody. Right. But unfortunately, the vast majority of my patients come in and they're really dejected. They're like, I tried. I spent you know four months and I really was good about my diet, but I'm still pretty miserable. Maybe I'm a little better. You know, Maybe it wasn't as bad, but it's not clear. It's not the, it's clearly not the root cause for a lot of patients. So that was the party line, but it was confusing and never made much sense. But about three years ago now, a guy named Gideon Lack published a beautiful paper where they looked at kids who were at high risk for peanut allergy. And based on this, this observation that in Israel, the little kids often eat these peanut snacks when they're yep. teething. Mm -hmm. And they found that they have like no peanut allergy there. Meanwhile, in America, we're going out of of control with peanut allergy. So they fed these high-risk babies peanut snacks, and they found that they cut the risk of peanut allergy by a huge amount. And so this really is all starting to fit together, that if you have this leaky skin, so eczema, leaky skin, food proteins get in through the skin. And this process is called transcutaneous sensitization. So sensitizing through your skin, and then you become allergic to the food. So in other words, it's not that the foods were driving the eczema. I mean, they can sometimes, once you're allergic, then any allergy thing can kind of stimulate it. But it really seems like the first thing that happened was you had eczema, leaky skin, you then became sensitive to the foods. And it follows that if we protect the skin, keep the barrier under control and protect it and keep the eczema down, it follows that we should be able to prevent food allergy, which is really exciting. Could you imagine just preventing the whole thing? You don't have to treat it. That would be huge. And I want to echo what you're saying, that a lot of my clients that come to me have tried, I can't even tell you how many very restrictive diets, and I've seen no improvement. And one big problem for everybody who's listening is, yes, sometimes you can go on certain types of restrictive diets and things improve, but then you can't get off of them. And so, you know, while tomatoes might be a trigger for one person, they aren't for everybody. So it's important to understand that there are underlying reasons why this is happening. And I oftentimes remind people that it's typically not the food that started it. It was something that caused the barrier to become leaky and allow the food or whatever it is to then stimulate the immune system in an unnatural way. So I just think that's important because we I think in the wellness world, we blame a lot on food, and Mm -hmm. I think that's actually not super helpful, especially to people who have chronic skin issues. So I just want to underscore that. I think that, and I appreciate you for sharing that. So someone's probably wondering, you've mentioned moisturizers a lot, and I know that a lot of people that I've seen and I've talked to and I've done like the eczema and psoriasis awareness week, like their concern is like, I've bought all these lotions at the grocery store and the, you know, like they say like super dry skin, like they, you know, they have all these fancy marketing titles that they're for eczema, they're for like extreme dry skin and nothing seems to work. So what do you 
find to be helpful when we're talking about moisturizing the skin from a medical perspective? What are some things we should think about? The good news is there's been a huge amount of science and understanding of moisturizers. And we are living in a really good time where it's hard to go wrong for the Mm. most part, especially if you pick one that's sort of designed for eczema skin or sensitive skin. For example, National Eczema Association has a beautiful webpage that has the products that are sort of on their seal of approval, that they've awarded the seal of approval. And, And the seal of approval is not perfect, but it really does try to weed out a lot of the, you know, the stuff that probably shouldn't be used for patients with with eczema. And it has many, many dozens of products now that are safe. So, so long as you pick, you know, sort of a good one at baseline, I really encourage people to experiment and explore a little bit. There is a very, very personal piece to the finding the right moisturizer. And sometimes a family will come in and they'll say, we've tried a whole bunch. We don't like any of them or particularly kids who say everything burns and stings. Mm -hmm. That's really, that's unpleasant. So I'll actually take a little time and I'll go to my sample closet and I'll make a little palette of a whole bunch of different ones of my favorites. And I'll put it on right there. We'll just do it together. I'll say, how does this one feel? Do you like that? And when, you know, the patient sort of says, oh, I love that one. That's great. I'm like, that's your, that's your moisturizer. That's going to suit you because you like it. It feels good. I want it to feel good. So we try to find that right balance. But the truth is you could go a lot of ways in general. I think we like heavier, more ointment based ones because they tend not to have preservatives. They're a little bit, you know, more occlusive. They never sting or burn. They're a little easier, but some people really don't like the feeling of that on their skin. Sometimes that even feels hot. Other patients really want to avoid petroleum. I'm not personally against petroleum products for the skin. I think they're really nice because they're so inert. They just sit on top and really cause, you know, a great barrier without being absorbed. But some patients really just would prefer to avoid them. And I respect that. So there's a lot of non-petroleum products. I, of course, love natural products too. We have to be a little bit careful because a lot of times some of the plant products will have tons of plants. You know, they're trying to get all the best. And so sometimes you can have an allergen tucked in there. But I really, I love coconut oil. I love sunflower seed oil. A lot of the products that use that as part of their blends. And so there's there's so many great options. And I think, you know, check out that NEA National Eczema Association page. You can get a ton of options, including some of the natural ones. You know, I think there are some cool natural ones. Yeah. And I'm going to put a link to that page. I'll find that for you guys who are listening. And I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes. So that way you can just easily click through. That'd be great. <laughs> I'll do Thank the work you. for Thank you, you for guys. You're welcome. Okay. So if you have eczema, And you're listening to this and you're like, all right, so I get that something is gone awry, whether I am not producing filagrin or I'm just making some sort of like not fully well formed filagrin, whatever's going on, my skin's leaky. Is it at all possible to, for somebody maybe who's listening, who has like psoriasis or anything else, like, is it possible that that could show up in other like seborrhea dermatitis, like, is there any research for those people that are listening that might be like, oh, maybe this does apply to me or should they just go, well, I guess I don't have this issue. No, I think you're right on. There is pretty good evidence that the skin barrier is deficient in, of course, eczema as we're talking about, but also psoriasis, rosacea, acne, seborrheic dermatitis, and probably other things that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head. But we know wherever there is inflammation in the skin, the barrier is in trouble a lot of times. Mm. And so we want to help with that barrier. So almost all of my regimens for whatever kind of inflammatory disease that I'm treating will have some kind of a moisturizer that helps. And I really like that. And I think that is important because if, if it is leaky, not only do we lose the water, but we also then have the risk of junk getting in that we don't want. So maybe your primary problem is psoriasis, but as you have this leaky skin, maybe your secondary problem then can become you're getting allergic to things or you're getting irritated by other things. So we really want to be on top of that no matter what, whenever there's inflammation. Okay. And I think the last point we'll make, and then I think what we should do, if you're game for this, I think you should come back. I mean, I feel like there's more information in your brain that you could share with us that we would love to hear because this is a really great conversation. And I don't want to overload people who are listening, but I sense that you have a lot of experience here. And I love the fact that you also straddle the more natural approach to things like you've done something really interesting that I I wish more dermatologists would do and be open to other options aside from just steroid cream antibiotic cream uh, <laughs> maybe antifungals it's a, it's, it's a bit of an uphill battle so it I, is yeah. it is and I hope that maybe you'll join us with that but is this why when people say I put steroid cream on my skin And it seems like things get better. It's from my perspective and my experience, because I had dyshydroidic eczema on my hands. It's almost like it's like putting the cap on inflammation that's happening. So could one argue that 
We don't have to go deep into it right now, but when you're using these topical steroid creams, as you're saying, like this inflammatory process is causing a problem that then creates this leaky skin barrier. It's like we're using the steroid. I do think that people should kind of use a steroid while they're going through whatever process they're going through. If that's been prescribed by their doctor, I did. I'm not anti-topical steroid creams, just being very mindful and cautious about how much you use. But I think that people don't fully understand that the steroid cream does connect with the inflammatory piece. I think you're right on. And, you know, I think with the steroids, I also... I will use them when we need them. I feel like they're a tool, but I'm really cautious about how long we're using them, how frequently people are using them, and most importantly, what is the pattern? You know, so what worries me is people who say, I used it, I got better. Almost everybody gets a little bit better, but then as soon as I stop, I flared up and I was worse than before. And sometimes then the natural thing is just go stronger and stronger and stronger. So I, I hit the brakes really quick. I'll say, you know what? We're going the wrong direction. If we're doing the right thing, then you should say, hey, I used it for a bit. I got better. I took a break. I was great for a while. That's what I'm listening for. It's sort of akin to the house is on fire and we keep putting out these little fires, but it's like, at some point we need to think, okay, there's a reason, you know, maybe the drapes are hanging over the stove. We have to make some kind of a structural change. We can't just keep putting out this fire. On the other hand, I sometimes have patients who don't want to use steroids at all. And I respect that, of course, but it is tough too, because it's like, well, the house is on fire. And I also want to find out why, but right now we got to put out the fire because if we wait and try to do a root cause analysis, you're going to burn your whole house down. So let's put out the fire and work together to solve it. But you know, some, you got to kind of straddle that line. Right. And I think that's the balance. Like I have clients that are like, I'm just going to throw it away. And I'm like, no, don't do that. (laughs) Don't do that. I still have mine. I've been a year free of hand eczema. I'm so happy, but it's still upstairs in the medicine cabinet. <laughs> so, and I like that. I mean, that's great. It's there at the ready. It's, you know, in case of emergency, right. break glass, you use it briefly. Exactly. If you felt like you were overusing it, then we hit the brakes and say, hey, this is not how it's meant to be used. But exactly. in those small doses, I think it can really help and, and you know, it can change your life. Exactly. So I think this this is sort of like veering in a much bigger conversation and there's so much more to talk about. So I hope that you will come back. I would love to. <laughs> Great. Well, I just want to make sure everybody can find you. So you can be found online over at chicagoeczema.com. You've also got a Facebook page and a Twitter account. So I will link to all of this. I will also link if you're a practitioner listening and you want to check out the book that I found online because I was Googling around and found Dr. Leo's book. It's called The Handbook of Integrative Dermatology and Evidence-Based Approach. How cool is that? It also has very good Amazon reviews, by the way. I will link to that. It is in my shopping cart and I have every intention of purchasing it. And I'm, I feel really honored that I'm talking to the one of the authors. This is so cool. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And I definitely will come back. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. All right, guys, that was a fantastic interview. I hope that you enjoyed it. And I am deeply appreciative to Dr. Leo for joining us. If you have a pressing question, it can be anything in regards to what's going on with your skin, head over to healthyskinshow.com and leave us a voicemail so that you can be featured in one of the upcoming episodes. All right. And don't forget, we are saving all of the links for you for anything that we talk about, products, books, other resources, over in this particular episode's show notes. So head over there to check everything out. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the next episode where we're going to continue to dive deep so that you can start rebuilding healthier skin.